Good morning. Good morning. My name is Eli Zalka. I'll be working with you for the next two days, so I guess we're stuck with each other over this weekend. Um, I, hope it, I hope you find it an interesting weekend. Um, as you all know, the subject is corporate and international venture capital. And it's really to start with, they're just going to take a look at the air, at venture capital. Um, needless to say, it's a very broad and reasonably deep field. So there's no prayer of really doing a comprehensive job of it over a weekend workshop. Um, but I'm hoping we do get a, you do get a feel of an overview for it. And more importantly, we're going to do some deep dives into some specific deals or some specific transactions or issues. Um, and I hope you get a reasonable feel for it. Um, it's, you know, I'm going to be asking you what your interests are, but this really, you know, the material we're covering here could be interesting or useful to you um, on the basis of any number of future paths. I myself, for example, I did a lot of my um, I had an entrepreneurial career initially, but then I had a good stretch, which was corporate. I was typically doing corporate strategy work, and I used corporate strategy as the vehicle to shift into doing venture capital and corporate venture capital and then traditional venture capital. Um, so it's clearly, I think, a good background for corporate strategy work in that, um, I don't know, those of you who've been involved in strategy work, it takes so long, and the venture is one of the ways of really accelerating, really leapfrogging strategically in doing things. Um, clearly, if anyone's interested in doing a startup um, or joining a startup or early stage companies, you know, I think getting some of this background could only be useful because you get a feel for some of the you know, some of the challenges in, involved in it. Um, frankly, I've had a whole bunch of students that are interested more in the social venture area and public policy area. And recently, you know, I'm involved in a new venture we're doing in Brazil right now. And so frankly, I've had the benefit of um, several MISS students actually introducing us and helping us, et cetera. And they're certainly seeing some, you know, some applicability to the subject. Um, um, moving on, here's some administrative information. Um, you really should feel free to get in touch with me either by telephone or email. I'm in the Palo Alto area. Um, anyone who's been my student has a permanent right and ability to get in touch if you feel comfortable about it and want to discuss a deal or a transaction or a venture or an investment or something new you're doing. Frankly, it's been a lot of fun engaging with a number of former students. That's one of the coolest things about doing this work. Um, personally, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not really a professor. I've done this for, I don't know, nine years or so at Monterey, but, you know, I do transactions, I do venture capital, and I start ventures rather than this is really a side thing and a fun side thing for me. It's also true over the course of the next couple of days, I'm going to expose you to a bunch of people. Um, several of them will be coming here in person. Um, a few of them I'll be introducing via video. Um, and the goal there is, again, to really sort of bring you into this community um, of essentially deal making. It's really a fun space. It's really an interesting space. And it has all kinds of implications financially, strategically, social policy, etc. So that's the administrative element. Um, before we start, I want to just give you a feel for the environment and speak about it a little bit. It's really a changing environment, the whole venture space. You know, dramatically changing environment. Um, and in some ways, it's really kind of lucky to, to be here now. The barriers to doing a venture have just really dropped dramatically. Um, and there's just a whole bunch of trends that are making it a lot easier. And frankly, my own observation, it's kind of really interesting, and I might, it might just reflect your generation, is you just see a lot more good deals. It's really amazing. You know, like, um, 
in, ter in terms of like seeing ventures that you look at the business plan and you say, hey, this is pretty competent. This is thought through. This is a reasonable team. Not, you know, there's always issues. There's ways of adding value. But I think just really the quality of venture that one sees has gone up. And, you know, my son has a, he manages bands, rock bands. He's got a company in San Francisco. So he's always looking for new talent to manage, etc. He's mentioned he's really ex he's noticed the same thing, like really competent bands coming forward. So I'm not quite sure this might just be a just a radically more competent generations you guys are bringing forward. But along those lines, some of these trends that are really enabling, you know, ventures and healthy ventures to really thrive. Um, one I think dramatically is just just the fact that the cost of doing a new venture, and when I say a venture, we're not talking about something that, you know, like a small business that's, you know, sort of a corner grocery store that's destined to remain that way. When I'm saying a venture, I mean, a, you know, a new enterprise which has the possibility of really serious explosive growth and being a substantial player. So that's like a really serious wealth creation vehicle. Um, at this point, you know, there really was a, you know, in so many areas, you know, the ability to enter has just radically changed. Um, certainly in terms of the web, you know, doing a web venture now versus, let's say, 1999 when there was an incredible boom going on. You know, the ability to do it and do it on a scalable basis has just, it's, it's I don't know, at least 10 times easier. Um, you see ventures being, you know, you see, um, incubators funding ventures to really take them to a point of like reasonable angel funding on the basis of $20,000, $10,000. And you see wonderful things coming out of this. Things like Airbnb that go on to do like a billion dollar valuation in a, in a recent round. Or Box, which has done also, I don't know, $1.2 billion valuation. These are things coming out of $18,000 investments. And that really is new. It used to be you were one of a thousand or a million that got picked, and then you got a few million dollars to put into it. So it was, you know, whereas, and those were the ones that really had a crack at that. Of course, there's always the exception. Now it's really, you know, it's changed in that way. I think intellectually, it's really a different situation as well. Um, there's just much deeper understanding. For example, there is a process called customer discovery process done by a guy called Steve Blank. He was an entrepreneur, then he became a VC. He's now a professor, actually. He teaches at Berkeley and Columbia. And it was something a lot of entrepreneurs did, but he really sort of codified it. And now it's like tons of people can follow that model um, where you know, you have a methodical process for um, testing things against potential consumers to see what people want. What do people want? What are people willing to pay for? I mean, it seems like a simple question, but it's really obviously the most difficult, complex question, you know, in doing a startup. And here's a methodology for doing it. So early on, you know, we'll see, um, Steve spoke to a recent class here, so rather than have him come down again, I'm going to have him, you know, we're going to just play the video of his recent talk here. There's really a methodology for doing it, a methodology that seems to be working. Um, agile development is really sort of the same thing, but now more on the software development side rather than the customer finding side. It's you know, it used to be development, software development, which is really the foundation of so many of these companies. Um, it used to be, it's, it's called waterfall methodology, where you know what you want to build, and, you know, you assemble a large team, and then you go step by step through it. And, you know, the development team sort of goes away for the next year or year and a half. And then they come back a year later, a year and a half later. Ta-da, here it is. And guess what? What that led to was, you know, a lot of the time, well, that's not what people wanted. Oh, that's not what we had in mind, you know. 
just massive costs, and it, just, it was just a huge bite to take out. Some of these agile development methodologies make it where the development team is back engaging with the customer like on a weekly basis. It's nowhere as efficient, but you know, for a startup, it's just radically transformative. And you can see how that process of agile development, where you keep showing what you're developing to the customer, really hooks right into the customer development process, which is about, hey, we only, you know, we're developing, we're trying to figure out what people want. And the best way to do that is to, hey, is this it? Oh, no, that's not it. Well, let's try, hey, how about this? Does it, does this, is this getting closer or further or whatever? Um, then beyond these, I guess, approaches that have emerged, you know, customer discovery process, agile development methodologies, then there's like some capabilities that have emerged in the market. Crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, you know, are just an incredibly democratizing factor in the ability to do a new venture. Crowdfunding, I mean, that speaks for itself. You don't need some big bad VC to back you. You can just get a whole bunch of friends or if you can get a following online or whatever to back you. And it comes in smaller amounts, but guess what? The new ventures require smaller amounts. But once they get going, hey, you can then go for the larger numbers. You know, that's it. You know, so hey, even the funding, you know, maybe the VC is getting eliminated. But on the sourcing also, using crowdsourcing platforms, which I hope, I don't, how many here are familiar with any of the crowdsourcing platforms? Let's say Amazon Turk or Fiverr or, okay about a third of the class. Um, it's kind of amazing. You can get some of these capabilities now for let's say you know, you're doing a new venture. For example, you need a logo, you need a home page, you need these things. Some of these platforms enable you to do it for like ludicrous sums, like $5 a piece, or you assemble a few of these things together. So it just radically, again, cut the cost and frankly increase the quality, I think, dramatically, where all of a sudden you have, you know, you have access to artists or programmers or developers worldwide, you know, and the cost implications of that, et cetera. Um, then you have a thing like Y Combinator. Um, how many people here read the articles by Paul Graham, which were assigned? Great, so that's super. So you have a feel for what combina why Combinator is about. Um, just to give you a sense of it, I mean, it's so transformative, why Combinator. It's amazing, really. Even in the Valley, you speak to people. I bet you 70% of people you run into in the Valley have never heard of Y Combinator. In my opinion, there's nothing in America which is transforming the startup picture and the venture business anywhere near the impact that Y Combinator has had. Just think about it. Till Y Combinator came around, um, or forgetting Y Combinator, what do you think the probability of you do a, you know, you're at the average Joe does a startup, what do you, and you know, they start doing something, what's the probability that they'll, let's say, raise a half a billion in funding? Which is an amount which is, hey, you know, you don't necessarily get that day one, but I, my sense is that even with things being cheap, et cetera, that's sort of what you need to now really do a play. You can do it for a lot less if you just want to demonstrate a play to get the funding. That they do with 15, 20,000. But what percentage get a half million in angel funding, for example? Any sense or any numbers anyone wants to throw out? It's like one in a thousand. So it's like a half a percent. What it would be one tenth of a percent? Um, y Combinator, Paul Graham decides, hey, I'm going to do this Y Combinator. The issue is really thinking process and relationships. And really, it's a thought issue. It's not a resource issue. And he brings in initially 10 people. To do, to do the Y Combinator program. 
they spend three months and $18,000. I mean, that's really a ludicrous sum. They come out of there, the first class has like a 65% funding level. If you go from one in a thousand to 65%, I mean, that's, that's, just an, you know, that's just an incredible explosion that's gone on. Y Combinator is now doing 80 companies a class. I mean, that's phenomenal. That's really phenomenal. The average Y Combinator company, after this $18,000 investment, three months later, is getting a valuation between five and $10 million. This is just a bunch of kids, you know, who have worked for a few months doing a PowerPoint. Um, they're averaging five to 10 million in funding for it. And when you think about it, and you know, some of these companies um, are generating, as I mentioned earlier, a billion dollar valuation now. Um, it's just phenomenal. Now think of like 80 of these coming out. You know, they're beginning to really crowd out the venture space. With 80 new ventures coming out, with this kind of quality, this kind of backing, this kind of guidance. So one first lesson is, when you're doing a startup, give, give a thought to applying to Y Combinator. And there's a bunch more. We're going to get exposed to that, by the way. There's another, um, there's another incubator, which I think is really, really cool, much newer than Y Combinator, Project Runway. And that was funded, that was started up by, um, by Schmidt, Apple, Google's chairman. Um, you know how with Y Combinator, at least you apply as a team with a concept. You say, this is what we want to do and this is our team. Now, between you and I, they don't give a darn about what your concept is. What they really want is the team. Um, but at least you walk in with a team and a concept. Project Runway, you don't even need a concept and you don't need a team. You just show up. And they just kind of mix, you know, mix up the groups, put them into new groups, etc. At the end of the thing, a process has been done which results in a team of three or four, which then they fund. They're doing really cool things. Um, tomorrow, afternoon, tomorrow morning, um, Charles Wang will be speaking about a project called Lumobac. Um, you know, very, very interesting space. Um, so these are the, the whole incubator space changing. And finally, there's these super angels. Angels used to be really purely like individual players, you know, doing it more on a social basis. And now there's really sort of angel networks that have grown that are, you know, that are fairly substantial and organized and really professional. And they're kind of pushing the VCs out of some of the early stage deals. The VCs are trying to respond. So looking at all these things, the radically lower cost, you know, some of these new mental processes that have been developed, agile development, customer discovery, you know, the crowdsourcing where you can get root, you can get funding, you can get resources. additional factors having to do with funding, the super angels and the incubators. It's really making for a dramatically new and really just very, very compelling um, future that's changing. In some ways, you could argue, while the whole venture space, I think, is exploding, you could say maybe the role of venture capital is shrinking in many ways. Um, an interesting observation about venture capital, I've just mentioned to you a couple of those deals from Y Combinator that came in at a billion. If you look at Y Combinator and the value it's created in the last few years since it started, and a good measure of that is how much market cap has been generated on the stock market or in the private equity market by y, y Combinator companies. The answer is 15 billion. I don't know, 15 or 20 billion, which is, by the way, a staggering number when you think about value creation in a few years. Something like 70% of that, 75% of that came out of two deals. So it's a crazily, crazily, the venture business, I think one observation I want you to make right now, 
it's a lottery game. A few crazy outliers end up representing just an enormous amount of the value. So like the top 20, you know, this is a good example. Here's Y Combinator. They create 20 billion in value. It's a huge thing. Three quarters of it is on the basis of two things. Um, I don't know, this has all kinds of implications, you know, and really interesting implications. You can imagine if that's how the value is happening, you'd imagine how an outfit like Y Combinator, if it's trying to optimize its benefits and its interests, in some ways it wants to, it would want to do the outliers. It would want to only do outliers. If their primary wealth creation is happening on the crazy home run, they don't have an interest in the five million, the 10 million, the 20 million dollar exit. And you can see how that's really fundamentally different um, experience from the fundamentally different motivation from the entrepreneur's perspective. It's a really weird and interesting thing. When you look at it institutionally, a $5 million win is nothing. Because, you know, for a hedge fund or a venture fund or whatever, it truly it's really is nothing. It's like represents some absurd minor percentage of the fund. Five million for an individual is life changing because they never have to work again. They can try all kinds of things. You know, they can <laughs> do things. So you can see how that's completely, you know, those motivations are so radically out of sync with each other. And it's kind of an interesting question how, you know, how that will play out. I'd like to go over the agenda for our next two days. And we may mess with this and change it. Um, I'm starting now, and I'm going to be going into an overview about venture capital. Within that, if time allows, I'm also going to be not just looking at the structure, but saying, you know, looking at it from the perspective. It's an interesting industry in that it's really optimized to be able to make all kinds of mistakes and still come out OK. It's absorbent of huge mistakes, and it's accepting of huge numbers of mistakes. And I think it's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, then I'm going to do a video of Steve Blank. And I think the main point there is, you know, people confuse startups. They think, oh, a startup is a small business, and then there's a large business, you know. But they confuse it with, you know, they think like, oh, a startup, you know, what's your revenue, what's your sales, what's your profit kind of thing. That's nonsense. Fundamentally, a startup is a search vehicle. You're searching for a business. All you're really trying to do is search. It's not a mini business, which is on a small scale and it's growing. What you're doing is radically different. In a business, you know what you're doing and you're going through some, opti you know, you're always optimizing and perfecting. In a startup, you're searching. You're searching for the customer. You're searching for a combination of customer and production capability, which generates a margin. It's really fundamentally different. Anyway, he takes a good hour making that point really, really clear. And in the process, he also introduces you to the whole customer discovery process, which I think is really critical and a central tenant of the new venture world. Um, then I'm going to get you started on a crowdfunding, crowdsourcing exercise where we're going to break into a number of groups. And some folks are going to be assigned to crowdsourcing, some folks to crowdfunding. But your team's going to study one of the platforms, put together a pitch, and come give it back to the students, sort of teaching the students. We'll break for lunch. And then I thought it'd be really best to start with an entrepreneur who's done a starting perspective. We're then going to shift and look at it from the VC perspective. Um, I used to, I, was, I founded a fund called Palo Alto Ventures. And in that, we ran the venture investments for Philips Electronics in Silicon Valley. And we also, so we did a bunch of corporate venture capital. But we also advised a lot of emerging ventures 
in how to play the corporate venture deal or the venture, how to basically, you know, obtain venture capital, typically through corporate means. Um, and, I, and we developed some simple diagnostic tools and analytical tools. I thought it'd be interesting to show you some of these tools. And I'll tell you, the main thing you take away from it is, like if you're thinking venture capital, oh, I'm going to learn a lot of technical specifics about venture capital, that's not really how it works. It's really you'll find yourself drawing on all your knowledge in finance, in strategy, in marketing, in the various functions. It's really more of a, taking a holistic view towards it. Obviously, there's factors that are very specific to startups because you only have a short lifeline and all those risks. But um, anyway, I hope you like it. Um, but in that, we're going to go through a whole bunch of cases, success cases, failure cases, things that look like they're going to succeed, and then they fail, and vice versa. Um, and then I thought we'd switch and then do, uh, again, a new entrepreneur's perspective. Um, we'll have Simon Burrell speak. Um, he's a very interesting guy, Englishman, living in Spain, doing a venture right now in Brazil. Um, and it's, I thought you'd find it interesting in that it's also in the lead generation space, which Rick's going to speak about. So you're going to learn a lot about lead generation. And one of Simon's team members is someone who was a partner of um, Rick's. So you see, like, the, you know, they did that venture. They had a success in the States. Now it's, I don't know, seven, eight years later, sort of re reconstituting it now, trying to do a similar play in an emerging market, um, which I think is going to be really interesting. I've tried to um, give you a little feel. Frankly, most venture capital happens in the US still. Like, I think it's 79% or some darn thing. It's huge. In this class, we're going to get a, more of a view of the international dimensions of it. And frankly, on the international dimensions, I thought, let's keep it focused. So I'm going to keep it focused on Brazil. We also have a presentation tomorrow afternoon by a Brazilian entrepreneur who's now very venture-backed. So it's like a later stage deal and very interesting. I see enormous opportunities in emerging market ventures and venture capital. Um, Eduardo, who will speak tomorrow, he'll, ta you know, he'll describe some ventures. Some of the biggest hits, you know, we don't hear about them. We hear about the Facebook deal, et cetera. You know, 40, 50 billion dollar IPOs in China um, coming out of incubated companies, amazing. Um, so then we'll close today. It's going to be a long day. Um, we start tomorrow. Um, we'll start by taking a look at corporate venture capital. I'll be lecturing on that. Um, both the motivation and the strategies, and you know, you'll see the cycle. We'll then shift the student crowdfunding presentations. I think that we'll do it tomorrow morning. This is the assignment I'm going to give you later on this morning. Um, crowdfunding and sourcing platforms. Um, and then we have again another entrepreneur comes in. This one with, I told you about, with OnRamp Incubator. His name is um, Charles Wong. And I think a very impressive founder and a very interesting and impressive company. Um, we'll break for lunch. Um, and then we'll do, uh, I, you have another lecture. Frankly, this one's a tough and relatively dry one, but I think it's really essential for you to get it. It's sort of like, what is the due diligence process, and what's the deal structuring? And, you know, peop and I think it's really essential, because people get confused. People confuse ownership with control. You know, you say, oh, yeah, I have 70% of the company. Of course I control it. You don't, you know, that's one of the things that's really interesting in venture capital. They've made a total clean separation. There's the owners, and then there's the controllers. And those are two totally clear and separate things. Um, and obviously, there's all these terms and vehicles and stuff. We're going to get into, really, to the weeds, which enable this control to, to, to be there. 
even if though it might be a tiny percentage. Um, I've left a little bit of time open tomorrow afternoon, just in case, frankly, a lot of times these things run longer, et cetera, so you never know. Um, I had, if time allows, I had a little venture. When I first came out of college, I had a little venture in Afghanistan, um, which really was a formative experience for me completely. You know, your first job, it's really crazy. You spend the rest of your career sort of repeating or getting influenced by it. Might want to speak about that. Um, and then finally, um, we have, again, another entrepreneur's perspective, this one with a venture back, you know, with a venture capital backed venture. Again, this is a Brazilian venture, Eduardo. Um, it's one of the hottest ventures in Brazil right now, actually. It's in the communication space. And then we'll close. So that's our plans for the next um, two days. Um, any questions about the agenda or? about some of our objectives. Yes? Just so that we can focus on your lectures, will you be sending us the presentation, the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. All the PowerPoints will be made available to you. Mine, as I believe the speakers as well, but I can certainly assure you about mine. Any other questions? Um, let me tell you a little bit about my own background, and then I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit. Um, I'm, it's sort of funny to start this way, but I was born and raised in Iran. Um, but I was an expat in Iran when I was born there. My family is Iraqi Jews, actually. And this is arcane, but believe it or not, when I was there, there was a good size, maybe 40, 50,000 um, Iraqi Jewish community within Iran. And these distinctions seem arcane, but they were very, very powerful and important. So like, frankly, even marriage between the Iraqi Jewish community and the Iranian Jewish community was like, oh my god, it's a you know, big problem, et cetera. Um, I was there till I was 14, went to Israel for two years, um, actually with my family. Um, it didn't work out for us. The change was really tough from Iran to Israel. The style was really different, etc. So at that point, I came to the States. I went to a boarding school for my last two years of high school, and then went to undergraduate. I went to Colgate and studied international relations, um, thinking I wanted to work with the UNDP, which was really much more influential and powerful at the time. Um, and then I had been in, um, then for a vacation after school, and I was, plan you know, I was set up for graduate work in actually Columbia School of International Affairs, and took a summer vacation with a buddy to Afghanistan. And we had this silly idea that, you know, we had $5,000 in capital, and it was like, well, we can either get a waiter job for the summer, like all our other friends, or we could go there, buy, quote, cool stuff, bring it back, sell it, make a boatload of money, and go to school. Um, we went, and frankly, it's really funny. These experiences, they become, they end up defining you in many ways. We went, and it was, you know, we did like a bunch of really stupid things. The first thing we did was we were going through India. So on the way, to, before we even got to Afghanistan, we spent $2,600 on a tiger skin, Bengal tiger skin, which I really regret having done now. I almost wonder about telling you guys. But we, we did, which was promptly confiscated by US Customs. <laughs> um, and then we spent the summer, like re literally three months, going around to villages and you know, tribal areas. This was like 1972. Um, we collecting old rifles and trading rifles. Now, mind you, neither of us had ever touched a gun before we got to Afghanistan. Never had shot a gun. We were totally unfamiliar with it. You know, my family would freak at seeing one. But you know, you learn and stuff. So we collected literally two tons of rifles over the course of the summer. You'll be pleased to know we had no trouble with customs on those. They flew, you know, duty free, came right up to the States. 
but it turned out there was absolutely no market for them. You know, in fact, the people had never even heard of Afghanistan. You say they're from Afghanistan. They say, is that in Africa? You know, and you know, we went to a gun show and everyone had these high-powered German rifles and stuff. And you know, we have these silly flintlocks and everything. So anyway, they didn't sell. I still have a load of them up in Palo Alto if anyone's interested. And we also bought a thousand men's wedding shirts. Um, I guess expecting a big wedding market in the US or something. These were beautiful. And they were worn by women primarily in the US, but everyone actually. Remember, this is the 70s. Um, and when we came back, they turned out to be like just devastating quality. Like, you know, splotches and, um, you know, just poorly sewn. Like the smalls were larger than the larges and, you know, really odd, horrible quality. Um, but what was interesting, it was like the ones that worked, the ones that weren't messed up. And you know, so at, guess what? We turned our dorm you know, thing into a dyeing operation, you know, because you, know, you wanted to get a lot of, rid of the spots, so you dye them black or dark green or whatever. Anyway, the ones that you could salvage, they sold. They sold really well. Um, so you know, we went around putting these shirts with local college boutiques. Um, and frankly, um, this really gives you a sense of how random these things are. One of these stores, you know, I kept going back to, you know, okay, well, you know, he had taken it on consignment. Well, they're sold. Do you want to give us our money? And he kept saying, no, come back in a week, come back in two weeks. So one time, finally, he said, look, if you want, you can come back in two weeks and I'll pay you. But alternately, I have a booth in a New York show for a jewelry line I have. If you'll take half the booth as compensation for what I owe you, you got it. So I said, sure. You know, of course, you know, hey, a show in New York, a trip, fun. I don't have to hassle this guy anymore. You know, we agreed. And frankly, our friends in Afghanistan, we told them, hey, we're doing a show. They just sent us a bunch of samples a Dutch girl had done with this little store there, which they liked. We come to New York. You know, we've never been to a fashion show. We're just sort of mimicking everyone else. Anyway, we wait till everyone goes home. At midnight, we sort of copy some of our neighbors, and we put together a display. We go and we crash. Of course, we oversleep. The show opens at 8. You know, we arrive at 11, sort of bleary-eyed. And you know, people say, it's not luck. But really, this was luck. We show up. We are a hit. We are already a hit. There's you know, the, the sheet has been ripped off our rack. There's cards from like Glamour and Mademoiselle, they want to feature it. You know, we have buyers from like some of the major stores and stuff. And it was crazy, like, you know, so that time, you know, during that show, to us it was like the equivalent of billions. But I remember we sold $22,000. Which was, you know, and we had like, I don't know, 60 retailers cover it, carrying the thing in the country. So anyway, at that point, I called up Columbia. Look, I'm not coming. We're doing this. It turned out to be just, uh, well, it became, first of all, the defining experience for me from a business perspective. Um, but it also just was a, it was just a wonderful, wonderful venture. Um, it's... First of all, we had so many interesting barriers to competitors because people couldn't operate in Afghanistan. It was really a wild zone. So most buyers weren't going to try to deal with it. And if they did try to deal with it, they'd come. They'd get bloodied, and they'd, they'd leave. The margins were insane. They truly were insane, which enabled us to do like, you know, we were really idealistic. Remember, we wanted to do UNDP. So at this point, we were like, hey, we're going to do our own social program. So we were doing like health insurance, you know, profit sharing, things that were just like completely unheard of over there. This thing scaled like to over a thousand people. And we were doing like throughout Europe, we were doing Japan, we were doing, I don't know, 300 retailers in the US. And it was just, uh, really a remarkable experience um, till the Soviet invasion happened. And 
we had at this point we had two comp we had there was one other company that was doing what we were doing a company called Hindu Kush we were called Kandahar Designs um, and I remember you know you used to hang out with the owner of this competitor they were based in New York we were based in Boston um, and he said you know well you know Ellie this thing is over with. I said, what do you mean it's over? Look, we got through the coup d'etat, we got through the earthquake, we'll get through the invasion. You know, sort of a naive view. And it's like, no, you don't get it. This thing really is over with. Um, anyway, I ended up acquiring his company, thinking of myself a brilliant strategist. We're going to get through this. You know, six months later, literally, we have Taylor's dying. It's horrific. You know, we're losing money like there's no tomorrow. You know, I went to our London distributor. I went on tour basically to tell our distributors, look, we're shutting it down. Sorry, it's been a great experience. The London distributor, my first stop, says, how can you close this? I love this collection. It's great. I'll buy it. I said, look, I've talked to, I was there. You know, I, I know what you're thinking. Well, just to let you know, he did buy it and he did make a go of it unlike my abilities at the time. What he did was he just, you know, it was really like a, you could say cold-blooded, but a really realistic view. He bought it and he kept the collection, he kept the lot, you know, the design, he kept the customer base and the brand, and he abandoned the Afghan production entirely. I mean, they took some hits in that process, trying to shift to India, but they made a go of it. In that, at that point, I was like a disaster area. You know, here I was like when I was 27, 26, people are like, oh, you're 26 or you're 28, you know, you're doing, I can't believe it, you know, this big thing, blah, 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 you know, feeling like a rock star. Now I'm 30 and it's like, this is the only thing I've ever done. You know, in Iran, we didn't even have summer jobs and stuff. So literally, I had never had a job, except going to the office with my dad when I was, I don't know, eight. Um, it's like, what am I going to do? What kind of a work I'll get? Went to the Caribbean for three months thinking, you know, I'm going to have this breakthrough concept and come back. Came back with a good tan and, you know, no money, you know, that most of the money was gone. Also, I had been insane, you know, like, you know, we were making millions on this thing. I hadn't thought for a moment about, look, there's personal money and then there's business money. It was just all one big thing. So when, when it went, it all went. I literally, you know. So what did I do at that point? It was like, frankly, in a sense of desperation, I said, I'm going to go to business school. I need like a, first of all, I badly needed a break emotionally. Secondly, I really needed to be re, repackaged somehow. Um, so that's what I did. I, that's what brought me to California. Went to business school. Um, at this point, I was 32. Um, and then I went into a corporate career. Um, out of there, I went into a brief thing of product management. I went to Tandem Computer, which was a very interesting company at the time. Most of you are probably not aware of it, but it was a cool architecture. What they did, they did systems that basically you couldn't break. So like literally we had, you know, we'd take a machine and we'd unplug it or we'd take an ax and slam it and, and you know, the, the system keeps going because it just turns over the work to other modules. It's fault tolerant, it's called. Anyway, did strategy work there after a brief period of doing um, product management and then got into ventures and I just loved that. Um, started using, and then I shifted to, I met up actually with a Dutch guy, um, a guy, again, you guys probably never heard of, but a guy called Rule Peeper, um, who was a turnaround guy. He had been the president of Unix System Laboratories. And he came to a startup called UB Networks, um, which was a devastated company. I joined him as head of strategy. And at that point, we did a series of companies together, which was really a lot of fun, where we used ventures as a turnaround tool. And frankly, we used ventures as a big communication tool to tell a story of things have transformed, things are radically different. 
um, in that process, we did one deal which was really transformative for me. Most deals I had done had to do with like technology or real substance exchanging hands. We did a deal with Steven Spielberg for this startup called Starbright Networks. Um, and it was a fascinating thing. Steven Spielberg had this venture called Starbright where the idea was to help children who were sick and dying, typically, um, typically hopeless situations. And the idea was they built these amazing playrooms, Disney-like playrooms, in major hospital centers to give these kids a good time. What's sad, however, is that really the sickest kids can't go to the playroom. They're just too devastated. So the thought was, at the time, we had made an investment in a company called Worlds, which was doing 3D worlds you know, with reasonable authoring tools, et cetera. Remember, this is like the mid-'90s. Um, so the idea was, what if we create, you know, what if we deployed cost is no object technology on behalf of these students in the form of like a, a unit that goes like right at the bedside? Um, and sort of turn Starbright into Starbright Networks and really transform it. So we approached Spielberg about doing this. They flipped out. They completely loved it. And we ended up putting together this initiative, which turned out to be, frankly, the biggest initiative in terms of, in terms of at least people getting impacted that I've ever been involved in. Though from a technology perspective, it was interesting, but it wasn't, it wasn't really business. I mean, you were just giving money away, basically. Um, but we did this thing where, you know, it was just massive ATM networks doing it, video conferencing, virtual worlds, students or the kids end up playing with each other and stuff. Anyway, this became like really one of the most transformative vehicles, both for Rule and myself career-wise, having pulled off this deal, and for the company's turnaround. Um, so anyway, we did a couple more of these. And, and I was doing the venture work and for UB Networks. And frankly, at one point it struck me, there was two of us doing the ventures at UB. We were making more money than the rest of the company combined. We really were, like sometimes triple what the rest of the company was doing. And this is something you'll see. That's one of the issues with corporate venture capital. How do you compensate the folks doing that? You know, you'd have to give us more, you know, multiples of the CEO. And, you know, that's not how, you know, cor you know corporations, et cetera, work. So obviously at that point it was like, look, I want to do this on my own as well. So then when I had a chance with Palo Alto Ventures, then we went to Tandem, went back actually to Tandem Computer where I had been. It had fallen on hard times. And that's one of the, you know, we did like an 18 month turnaround effort with one of the key elements being really the whole perception game. And one of the other elements being, hey, we're entering the entertainment industry. Tandem was always known for running ATM networks, stock exchanges, et cetera. But it was viewed as, it's, you know, it, this isn't an exciting space. This isn't a growth space. These have been played and they're there. So, you know, our argument was the entertainment world is becoming mission critical and absolutely required. So we went through doing deals with Disney, Planet Hollywood, creative artists, blah, 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 as part of this. Anyway, the tandem, that was an amazing, that was an amazing transaction, actually. These are things that you see in, I guess, in business, which are remarkable. The company had an $850 million valuation when we joined it, when the turnaround started. Um, 19 months later, a little more than a year and a half later, um, it was acquired by Compaq Computer at $3.4 billion. So there was like just an enormous amount of value created. Then there was the tour of the merger being taken around to the analyst community. And there's typically like a 30-day period before the deal closes. The market cap on the deal had gone up to 4.3 billion. 
at the time we actually closed. So frankly, at that point, you know, the turnaround team, it was like, it's party time, <laughs> you know, it's really like a crazy, crazy scene. So I said, okay, something new. I started Palo Alto Ventures at that time um, with sort of a premise of, you know, frankly, I had tried to sell the idea of let's use scenarios as an investment vehicle. And everyone thought it's too intellectual, it's too heady and stuff. No, let's look at the deal and stuff. In this case, I, you know, that's one of the nice things when you start your own. You say, no, this is how we're doing it, and let's see if people come. Well, Phillips flipped out for the idea. We did Palo Alto Ventures. Um, within that, we had one venture which really, again, you know, these deals are about home runs. We put $10 million into TiVo. Are you familiar with TiVo, the yeah. device from home? Right. So that at the time was going crazy. So Philips made, took 190 million on the $10 million investment, and that was like within eight months or something. So at that point, Philips was, we're in hardcore. <laughs> Let's really play this game and stuff. Um, I sold Palo Alto Ventures in 2004, but frankly, that was one of the things we did for Palo Alto Ventures, the deals with, um, and we'll go into some of this later on. But the other side we went to is we just dealt with you know, independent startups. What do you have? What are you trying to do? Can we really add value in turning this into a successful deal? So later on in the afternoon, you're going to see some of these things. It'll amaze you, really. There's a lot of opportunities to add just tremendous amount of value and to capture the value in this, in this game. Um, so I did that. I got out. I did a venture called LiveWall. Probably the mo you know, one of the most, frankly, it was inspired by the Spielberg thing. It bombed royally. Um, didn't, you know, it really never got off the ground, actually. Um, and then I did a venture called um, Euro Profile, which was sort of an interesting idea. And I think an idea, especially a group this international, could, could potentially benefit from. The thought was, why don't we look for US-based ventures that have been successful? And let's see if we can apply them to other countries where you get the full benefit of the US venture. Now, there's a bunch of people doing that, doing cloning, where they clone it. Typically, those are focused on the hot, hot, hot new thing. Like Groupon comes on, it's hot in the States. There's literally, there was, 600 clones in Brazil alone of Groupon, etc. That's not what we were talking about. We're talking about more fundamental niche businesses with really nice value propositions, nice differentiation, um, and which are not these ephemeral things that just sort of rise and you know one player takes it all kind of deal. I have no objection to those, and they're cool. But we were trying to do something different. So there was a company in the US called iProfile, which we saw. Nice family business doing really you know, crazy margins, really loyal customers. And what they did was they did um, these in-depth reports, really in-depth reports, which they did on Fortune 500 companies in the US with a focus on their information technology strategy and personnel. And within it was a feature which blew people's minds, which was an org chart of the IT organization with email addresses and telephone numbers. That capability to a computer vendor or a software vendor or a computer services vendor is like a dream come true. Because you know they're all trying to sell to the Fortune 500. If you give them this, they know what, you know, salesmen want to get on the phone and talk to someone. They don't want to do in-depth, weird campaigns. Anyway, we saw this. We said, wow, this is really beautiful. We can't believe they're not doing it in Europe or Asia, et cetera. So we approached them. Hey, we think you're doing a wonderful thing. And they've been doing it for like 12 years. Um, we think it's a wonderful thing. Do you want to try it in Europe? You know, maybe, you know, we think, we think there's a real market for this in Europe. Do you want to do it collaboratively, et cetera? And they were like, and they were really like cagey. No, no, we don't want to do it, do anything. You know, 
you know, we're thinking of doing this. Do you want to do, you know, we'll give you a share of it if you give us a little guidance. This, uh, no, no, we don't want to give, we don't want to even do referrals. We don't, you know, we just don't want to do anything. Do you have any objection to us doing it? You can do any damn thing you want, but just, you know, frankly, just stay away from us. Okay. So, frankly, most of what they did was obvious. I mean, you know, you just, you see what they're, you see their product, it's, you look at it and, you know, it's a question of how do you do it. Of course, they had some proprietary methods to gather the information or whatever, but it's not rocket science and hey, you know, they have their way, you can figure out new ways, maybe even better ways. So we tried it in London and frankly, we tried this whole idea of can we do on super low cost? This is when some of the, these new ideas about super low cost ventures were coming out. So the idea was, can we try this for five grand? Um, and so literally we did a website, we did five samples, which was really not easy, frankly. Um, we showed it, you know, immediately, you know, interesting. Um, anyway, a year and a half later, um, we were as big as the American company. And frankly, we had added all kinds of new features and stuff because they were, you know, they were sort of comfortable, whereas we were sort of running. Um, so we came back to this, you know, so we figured, hey man, the US market, you know, frankly, a lot of our customers, you know, they want, they're global players. Um, so we approached the US company, do you want to participate, do you want to play? Before long, they said, we want to sell. We bought. We acquired them, um, largely for stock, by the way, but some cash up front. Um, and in fact, all we did was we combined it with what we had. We dressed it up some more. So now we had Europe covered. We had the US covered. And we started a little venture within the company, Asia Profiles. And we immediately went to private equity. Look, we want to sell out. Um, we did. It was a. It was really a beautiful exit for us and for, you know, the American company originally that was now our partners. Um, and the last few years been um, doing some of this teaching, been doing also some lecturing at Stanford, playing with some ventures and, um, you know, advising some ventures and actually trying to start up some things. You're going to, later on, you're going to see some of them. So, that's my long-winded story, but seeing as you're going to be spending the next two days with me, I thought I'd do a detailed version. <laughs>